Uh, let me start by giving a short introduction of our speaker, Scarlett uh, Statler. And uh, uh, Scarlett, uh, she is a meteorologist uh, in Yuli Super, Supercomputing Center. And uh, uh, she studies uh, weather, uh, meteorology, and air quality in general. And she also utilizes machine learning in her research. And so today, she will give a speech uh, addressing uh, atmosphere rig chemistry in machine learning models. Um, started, uh, stage is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Yeah, well, welcome everyone. I'm, I'm glad and honored to give the presentation here at Casos. And I want to present you my research on unboxing a black box or two black boxes, that's why it's plural here. And it's a, a look at the representation of adversary chemistry and machine learning models. So today I give you a small lecture. So I uh, outlined this as follows. So first I want to give you a general overview uh, of in, in which domain intersections actually my research has to be located. So everyone is on the same page. Uh, also then I want to introduce the atmospheric, atmospheric chemistry I'm dealing with because I do not assume that you are all atmospheric chemists and know this. I want to present you the data I'm working with and afterwards also the machine learning frameworks. So I know some of you may be already working with machine learning, but it's very important to understand or recapitulate these machine learning te techniques in detail to continue with my uh, results, which is then unboxing these black boxes and uh, yeah, looking at the machine learning, ex especially for our atmospheric chemistry data set. Okay, so let's take a look at the larger context of my research. So basically what the, like the final vision, and I think that's not only my vision, but many, uh, many researchers are working on this is creating Earth AI. So basically bringing Earth system science together with artificial intelligence. And if I now take this new field of Earth AI, then I as a atmospheric chemist or my background in metrology and atmospheric chemistry, I'm working exactly at the intersection between the machine learning and the atmospheric chemistry. And again, this intersection might be very large, but I'm especially concerned with explaining the machine learning, which was trained on atmospheric chemistry. Okay, and with that color scheme, I tried to uh, give you more guidance to, uh, through my talk. So first we will stay a bit in the like pure atmospheric chemistry domain. And then again, already the blending of uh, atmospheric chemistry and machine learning would, will start with introducing the, the data sets and the neural networks as I uh, indicated before. Okay, so tropospheric ozone formation process, some atmospheric chemistry background. Uh, the motivation behind why do we want to understand uh, tropospheric ozone, not only scientific, but very practical, as this is the ozone which surrounds us, meaning what we are breathing in, uh, we are concerned with, with its uh, effects on humans, on animals, and also on plants and agriculture. So this is like very basic motivation why we are concerned with tropospheric ozone formation. The problem is that the tropospheric ozone modeling is a difficult task. So it is, it is done in, in different ways, and until now, the understanding of uh, tropospheric ozone can be summarized in this graphic. So we have different uh, parts of this chemistry. So may most important thing to know is that ozone is not emitted directly. So if we want to control ozone, we cannot just say, okay, we don't emit it anymore because that will not help. There is no emission source. And on the other hand, there are other emissions which actually contribute to the ozone formation, which are from anthropogenic origin, for example, this um, nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds, but also biogenic emissions play a role in ozone formation. And, and these have, a, have an impact on the, on the ozone concentration, but the ozone is also long-lived, so it can be transported. Also, its precursors can be transported. It can be removed by, for example, scavenging. So this is the H2O part here. So with rains and the, the concentration decreases a bit and it can interact with water bodies. So as you see, this, the transport, the chemistry, all the emissions makes a very complex system here. And modeling is naturally a difficult task. But as I also motivated, we are concerned about the ozone concentration. And this is why also there are ozone measurement networks and measurement stations. And in the tropospheric ozone assessment report, 
which is a, a global huge effort to actually collect all these different data sets. So as you see here in, on this map, there are data, uh, also measurements, real observations distributed around the world, but before they were not in one place. They all their, their own governments had their measurement stations and their network, and then there was another government, they had their own data. And this Ozone Assessment Report actually made a huge effort to collect all of these and put it into one database. And this is now open access. And you can get ozone metrics from the database, like average ozone or maximum ozone during daytime or during nighttime. Such things are calculated there and you can actually get them. And one very important thing of uh, this tropospheric ozone assessment report, I don't think that was their goal in, in, like initially, but it's actually an enable, enabler to explore data-driven approaches on ozone data, because we only need first enough data, enough, enough observations before we can actually start doing that. And this database is great, but all of you who already tried machine learning on their own data know that it's, uh, it requires a lot of pre-processing. So, that's what we basically did in this paper. So AQBench is our benchmark data set for ozone metrics. And there we already tried to uh, do all this pre-processing, clean the data, uh, bring it in a format that machine learning can actually take it in easily and then and use it. And in machine learning, in the machine learning community, something very normal is not to only publish a data set, but publish a data set together with a task. And that's what we did here. So we on one hand, we collected all this ozone data and matched it together with geospatial data. By geospatial data, I mean the data which describes the surrounding of the ozone station. In the picture before, we have seen that the ozone formation process is controlled by many factors. So there are many things which actually like this precursor emissions. And we, we might not have measurements, but we can see, OK, there is a city. And we can see there is a forest or there is water body. And and this is something we can actually input as geospatial information surrounding a, a certain station. And now the task, what has the machine learning to, to help us or to uh, support us with? If we take now this geospatial data and we want to infer the ozone value, for example, the average ozone at that station, can machine learning help us with it? Because traditional modeling would need like the chemicals and then we have chemical equations, but for machine learning, maybe it can help us to uh, get to the ozone values. Okay, so that was the small introduction of atmospheric chemistry. So now you know uh, what problem I have, what data I have, and now we go to the details how to solve the problem. The machine learning uh, I want to present to you today is the shallow neural network and the random forest. So let's start with the shallow neural networks. Maybe all of you already know, maybe not. So shallow neural networks consist of neurons. And these neurons, they take in inputs, which could be input features like this geospatial data, some, something, or they could be inputs from another neuron, which we will see later on the right side. So here on the left side, we see we have the inputs and some weights, which uh, are multiplied with the input and the bias. And this value together, the weights plus the bias is called Z value. And this goes into an activation function. And this activation function then determines which numerical value will go out of the neuron. I just show you one activation function today, which is the rectified linear unit, because that's what we are actually using in our shallow neural network. So shallow neural networks consist of several neurons. And the definition of a shallow neural network is that it consists only of one or two hidden layers. If you have more hidden layers, then you go into the deep neural network range. And how do you train this? It's basically uh, you train it iteratively. So first you, you have your network, you put something in, make a prediction, which is at the beginning pretty random. That's why you need a loss function, which compares your, your predicted value and your uh, observed value, so we're, we are using supervised learning in that sense, and then it uh, back propagates via the uh, differentials and, or back propagation. It adjusts all weights so that the next prediction gets improved. So basically, this is how we train the neural network. And once we make a prediction, we just feed in our input and get our predicted value. Okay, so quick look at the end. Uh, uh, at the neural network, and now we will take another look, which is completely different machine learning algorithm. It's called the random forest. For the random forest, we 
take the training data set. So we have, uh, I mean, we have a whole data set. We have to take just a training data set and divide it into sub data sets randomly. So it's called bootstrapping. And with the bootstrapping, we have then sub data sets from one un until n, for example. And on each of these sub data sets, we fit one decision tree. So decision tree, I have just brought you exemplary here. This is just a tree which splits the data according to some feature. For example, again, we have our spatial, uh, geospatial feature and it says, okay, if the altitude is higher or lower is this, then it uh, makes the first split of the data set and continues splitting the data set until every uh, leaf is basically giving your prediction perfectly fitted to that sub data set. You do this n times, you have n forests, uh, n trees, and these trees all together, if you want to make a prediction, you feed in one sample of the test data set. Each tree ends, uh, lets it end up in one leaf. So this is a certain prediction value. And the final prediction value is just uh, gotten by uh, summarizing all these prediction values and dividing by the number of trees or taking the average value, basically. So very simple approach of uh, getting the prediction. Okay, so now we are on the same page about the machine learning and we can uh, dive into the results. So unboxing the black boxes. Let's go a step back to the AQBench data set. Uh, here I just give you an overview of the uh, stations for the AQBench data set, which are based on the TOR database. So you might recognize the same pattern. We have large uh, or a large coverage of, around US, around Europe, and also uh, Southeast Asia. So Japan, uh, South Korea, and also Taiwan have a lot of stations. So their data coverage is pretty good. But there are also some stations spread around the world. So this is basically the data set we're dealing with. Uh, for our AQBench benchmark uh, experiments, what we used is the coefficient of determination R2 to just be able to compare different machine learning models. So this is basically our criterion of accuracy or, or how we measure how good the performance of one model is. And it explains the variation which can be explained or can be captured by our model. Uh, and for, for this paper, what we did is, okay, we set a benchmark. First, we tried also linear regression to see how, how it is improved, improved compared to uh, linear regression. And we see that the neural network uh, and the random forests are pretty similar in terms of performance, while the random forest performs slightly better. So that's why these values are bold and the neural network values are underscored. And in general, it, it's nice to look at what and one metric, but uh, maybe you also know from your problems when you're dealing with that one, one number uh, is, is not enough to say how good your model is, especially when you look at this data set, which is not very distributed evenly around the world. So basically what we want is a model that works everywhere and doesn't only work good on Europe, for example. So there is an experiment you can do. How well does actually the neural network and the random forest generalize to unseen regions? And to test that, what we did is we divided the, the uh, data set into three world regions. We said, okay, if we have three parts, we have one uh, North American, one European data set, and an East Asian data set. Uh, if we only train on two of these data sets and test on the third one, because we know we actually have observations on the third one, uh, we can see if our model generalized well or not well. And yeah, you already might have read it. So <laughs> spoiler alarm, the neural network did a very, very bad job at that. So the the coefficient of determination I showed you before even got below zero. So it was really, really bad. And the random forest performance also dropped because it had less data and maybe it's not perfectly, uh, so East Asian data is maybe not perfectly characterized by looking at European data. It, so the random forest performance dropped too, but it was still acceptable. It was not like, oh, super bad, I, I can throw that away. And these two things actually lead me to my research question. So given AQBench, given our uh, atmospheric chemistry data set, why does the random forest outperform the shell neural network? Because usually now what I see in literature is you compare different models, you say, that's the best score, that's my best model, and that's, for, that's it, then we're happy. And that's how also we published it. But I wonder now, why is that actually? Why is the random forest doing a better job? So I hope I can take you now with me on my research and let's answer this question. 
Okay, so first thing I thought, okay, we saw from the experiment on different regions that the random forest has better generalizability. And so I thought, okay, let's let's check a bit more the test data set because before we were using a lot of tra the training data set and also check on the training and validation data set. But this time I only look at the test data set, which means that the models never seen this data before. It's completely unknown data to them. Uh, here in the middle, you can see the observed average ozone values. So this is how uh, it was measured, basically. And this is the prediction by the neural network and the prediction by the random forest, which in first thing, what I uh, noticed is that the, the histogram is less wide. Like it, it's more peaked around the mean value, which is around 28 dBb. What I also see is on the uh, y-axis, you have the counts, like how many times uh, on the, on the, of these test samples was a certain value reached. So basically the mean value is here in the middle. And for the neural network, nearly half of the time, so the test set is 1,100 uh, samples large, uh, we have just the average value predicted. And with that, it gets a really good, uh, a pretty good um, R2 score. The random force in, instead is a bit more variable. And this slight variability already is enough that it uh, generalizes better. And then I thought, OK, is my random forest maybe more complex than my neural network? I introduced to you that we're using a shallow neural network. So it's not like a deep neural network, which will be able to overfit and get every data point. So I thought, like, OK, is maybe our random forest more complex? And for, for that, or and this is an open discussion, so please uh, feel free to share your opinion. Our neural network has 702 trainable parameters. I can count that. That's, that's easy to do. Our random forest has 100 trees, which is pretty standard. So it's, it's not like we hyper-tuned it to found that 100 trees is the best, but this is more or less a default value. And if we have 100 trees with unlimited depth, then we have like four, or we have exactly 400, 22,220 times that it splits the data. So each of the splits, if we count that, we get to that high number. And the question is, okay, can we compare one split from a random forest to one parameter of a neural network? If so, then I, I ask the question, maybe our random forest is just more complex than our neural network, and maybe that's the reason for its better performance. But as I said, I, I have a hard time comparing comparing the complexity of two machine learning uh, models, which are of completely different architecture. Another question I asked myself is, okay, if it's better, is it always better? Like, is it also better on uh, areas or on stations where the neural network fails? So what I did here is I, uh, I checked the residuals. So the residual, how I define it is just take the observation, subtract the prediction, and you get some error, right? Some residual. And these ones I plotted here. So x-axis is the random forest residual, and uh, y-axis is the neural network residual. And it's pretty interesting that they look like they're super linear correlated near to the one-to-one -one line. And on areas, which I, I would say, okay, this is where both models fail a lot, like we have deviances above 10 ppb and nearly uh, to 15 ppb, both models do a bad job. Yeah, is, is, there, a, is there a question? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so I want uh, now to go into uh, look at examples. And I want to compare both um, models using an example station. That's where we go into this visualization of uh, the explainable machine learning. OK, so the station I chose for the comparison is actually a station which is uh, with a very low residual below 5 ppb. And it's in uh, around Barcelona, so in, in Spain. It's a high ozone station. So High ozone means it's far away from the average, but still both models did a good job in predicting uh, the value here. The observation is 42.4 ppb. Are you trying to do the same with me? Uh, Are you trying to connect uh, to the server? To the server? Ah, maybe Anna? Uh, 
you have a question? Okay. I think they are maybe they are discussing in their room. I I tried to mute them, but uh, somehow couldn't find a way. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, I, I think let's ignore them. Yeah. Okay. okay. So uh, yeah, we have here the the station I want to show you, and I want to ex explain you based on the station which visualizations can help us to understand how the models are actually working. And let's start with the neural network visualizations or the visualization of weights and biases and activations. So uh, I introduced you already to the, to the neuron. And this is the way how we can actually visualize the different values which contribute to this neuron. So now we don't think about the features. We just think about the weights and the bias. If we have a weight which is below zero, we can draw it draw a blue line. So it's just the blue values are everything below zero. A red value is above zero and the shade of the blue or the red can point to the magnitude of the, of the value of the uh, weight. For the bias, we can do the same. So a, a bias which is positive has a triangle pointing up and also the color red. So it's kind of random information. And here it's, it's an activation because I wanted to have it consistent here, but basically this is the weight to the next neuron, which in this case is also above zero and that's why it's uh, light pinkish. And now I want to show you how, how our neural network actually then looks, so our trained neural network. On the right side, you see our trained neural network. We have all these uh, input, inputs here on, on the uh, yeah, left side, which basically characterize what's happening around the station. For example, we, I don't know if you can read, it's maybe a bit small, like population density or latitude, relative altitude, all these um, features are on the input, uh, the input layer. Then we have the connections to the first hidden layer. And here we can already see something very interesting. So these th three uh, features here at the bottom, they tend to have a lot of like more visible for, for us humans, more visible because of the color uh, connections to the, to the first hidden layer. And it turns out that these are also the more important features overall for the whole uh, network and also for the random forest. Uh, here we see that there's like a central uh, neuron which kind of this is kind of important, but here we have more neurons which have uh, prominent uh, weights to the, to the second hidden layer. And I think the second hidden layer and the output layer these connections are most interesting. We have one blue connection here. So this neuron actually controls the prediction to be lowered. So if this neuron is active, then we have a negative value. And because we have the relu function, this will be lowered. And we have three neurons which will push up our predicted value. So, but that was the neural network in like, as we trained it and it's inactive, but what now if we're doing a prediction, how does the neural network look then? To do that, we take like in the previous example, the same weights and the same bias, but let's assume something for the inputs. So if we assume that our uh, feature is below zero, or like X1 is below zero, X2 is above zero, X3 is also above zero, but not so strong, then uh, multiplying it with the weight, we get uh, a a z value which is larger zero, zero and as we seen from the relo function then it will predict us the same same z value so basically this looks like an active neuron but we can have the opposite example too that our uh, x1 this time is uh, above zero and maybe large above zero in this example the other two features are above zero but not so strong and what happens now is that uh, if it's multiplied with the weight then we have a blue weight or a negative value and because of our relu function which is about, uh, below zero the there is no activation so it's like just uh, they kill the signal and now we remember our station in spain which was a high ozone station and we can look how our neural network actually did the prediction and we see here that some input features are more important. That's why they, they get very high, high values from, from, the, from the input uh, layer. And these are connected to the first hidden layer. In a way, the, uh, the weights sum up that 
a lot of neurons actually get deactivated. There are so important neurons which continue to be activated and transmit the signal to the second uh, hidden layer. And here we see very nicely that the, this uh, upper neuron here and the second hidden layer, which is responsible for reducing the output value, gets deactivated. And all the other neurons which are still active, they try to increase the prediction, which fits to what we're expecting for our high ozone station here. Okay, so that was the visualization of the neural network, but let's look at what our random forest is doing. So we call the plot leaf node station contributions. I will walk you very slowly through it. It's kind of not so easy to grasp. Okay, so remember we have our AQ bench ozone stations. And what happens now if we have already our trained random forest? So on the left side, these are two example trees of our trained random forest. What we can do now is we send each training station through our forest. And we remember in which leaf node the station ended up. And now we can do the same and send one test station, which I call station 10, also to, through the random forest. And we can also note down in which leaf it ended up. So what we get is we get the leaf nodes and we know which tree ID, or which tree has which leaf node and uh, which stations are within these leaf nodes. So it's a bit hard to understand, but so we, we have one tree. We propagated all the training stations in there. So we know exactly for each leaf node, we know which training stations are in there. And now we only use one test station propagated to each tree and note down in which it ended up. So basically test station uh, 10 has ones, one, two, three, five, as like companion stations in one leaf. And another time it has two, six, and eight. And from, from this information, I would say, okay, we have six unique stations and station two appears twice. And if I now plot that on a map, because I have the station data and I actually have always the coordinates of the map, uh, of the stations, I can plot a map and check, okay, test station 10 is now in West Germany. And then there is the station with frequency two is very near to that. I mean, that's what I expect, right? So that uh, similar uh, predictors in, for one station would work also for the, for the test station. But then there are also, also other stations uh, plotted here, which are scattered around. And we can do that with all the stations. Again, let's take our, uh, station here in Spain. And for that, we get a global view actually. So it's not that the random forest only looks at stations in Spain, but it looks at uh, many, many stations globally. And here I uh, plotted the contribution. So darker stations, like in the other plot means it's not uh, very often that this station appears and brighter ones means, okay, this one appears very often. So probably it's very similar to the one we are want to predict. So we have for this particular example, 179 stations which contribute to all these leaf nodes to make the prediction and unique stations is 63. And also I think which is pretty interesting and maybe points to why our random forest generalizes better is that all these trees make a different prediction, right? And the maximum prediction is even 65 ppb, so very, very high, much too high. And the minimum is 19. So the spread is also very um, variable or very large in this, in this uh, case. And if we now zoom in <clears throat> to Spain, we see that nearly directly next to our target, there is one station which has even 14% contribution. So 14% of the times it appears uh, there and uh, has a high impact on the prediction. But we have also other stations here which are more light like this pinkish station or here more purple that also contribute more, which means appear more often. And with that, I would like to conclude why I think that our random forest outperforms our neural network for a Q-bench. So random forest considers stations with similar features to make it pre its prediction. And that's what we've seen in the last example. While the uh, neural network fix, fits a single function to all training data, which in our case, because it's a shallow neural network, is not able to capture the data complexity. The random forest uh, uses bootstrapping to, to get all these uh, subsets I, I explained before. 
And this leads to very variable decision trees. And so the decision trees also give very variable uh, predictions, which then we take the average and make our final prediction. Unfortunately, our neural network has no bootstrapping. So the optimum can only be found near the, to the mean value. So it's not like the, it does a bad job, but it's like this is the best job it can do with what we, we gave it. Then if we assume that our random forest has like around 400,000 parameters and our neural network only 700, maybe it's very of a higher complexity and that's why it can uh, capture a higher complexity. While well, a simple model has its limitations and we cannot increase the depth uh, of our neural network because our AQ bench, so our data set is just too small. So it's, it wouldn't help us. And that's why I think that in general, the random forest generalizes better and the neural network predictions collapse with the mean value. But I also showed you that in AQ bench, there are some test stations which cannot be captured by both models. And that's what made me think like, okay, if both models cannot capture them, maybe the reason lies within the features of these stations and not so much in, in the model architectures. So it seems that the training data set cannot represent these test, uh, test stations well. That's why we failed to predict them at all. So I have to conclude here that the random forest is better on a bench than our neural network, but it's also not perfect and not unconditionally better. And yeah, with that, uh, I hope uh, you have a lot of questions or ideas or comments to discuss. Yeah, thank you for the talk, uh, Scarlett. So let me summarize a little bit. So you are starting with the spatial station data. Uh, I look at a the data set and it contains 5K samples around, around 5K samples, and it does not contain temporal scale information. It only, uh, yeah, spatial information. And for 5K samples, around 5K samples, you tried both neural networks and uh, random forests. And you see the performance gap that uh, random forest uh, outperforms neural nets. And so then you are, you did a detailed analysis with uh, neural activations and uh, also the leaves uh, branches of the random forest to see why there is such a bias. And so that is a very good work. And so um, let, let me for, let let us first open our questions to the general audience. 